Okay, hello everybody. Uh, this is lecture two, uh, maybe titled Rotate, Compute, Rotate. As I mentioned last time, this is kind of like a little three word slogan for what compu uh, quantum computation is all about. And uh, this lecture is also going to be like another high level lecture where we won't actually properly do anything. Uh, I'll tell you about, in some sense, you know, how quantum computing is just like classical computing with like one extra power, which is embodied in this statement. And like next lecture, lecture three, we'll actually properly get into like, okay, the basics, like what is a qubit and a, a vector and so forth and so on. Um, but we'll start with some kind of explanation like this. In fact, one thing I'll start at the beginning is uh, by saying is that uh, even a little bit of a slogan of what quantum mechanics, you know, the mathematical or laws of physics governing, governing small particles is about. And if this had to be summarized in like a few words, uh, it would be basically uh, probability but with minus signs. Of course, probabilities, probabilities are non negative numbers. But uh, suppose I gave you the task of inventing like a generalization or a souped up version of probability theory, but where somehow the probabilities could be negative. And I said, you know, do it in like the most conservative way possible, like, you know, just trying to make some kind of mathematical theory that's like not crazy, but it has to have this feature that they're like the probabilities can be negative. Uh, then you would invent quantum mechanics. Like that's what you would invent. It's like the most conservative extension with this, uh, this feature. Um, so we'll see that throughout the course, but this is a good way to think about the mathematical laws underlying quantum mechanics and this quantum computing, that's quantum computing. And in fact, uh, there's a way in which I feel like quantum computing is not much more of a riff on classical computing than probabilistic computing is a riff on classical computing. So I actually want to spend a bunch of time talking about um, probabilistic computing, or randomized computing, randomized algorithms. Probabil, uh oh, you know what I'm going for here. Okay, I'm going to spend um, a while telling you about probabilistic computing. It'll be like a long parable for quantum computing. So in the 1970s, some computer scientists like John Gill, Janusz Simon, they had a fantastic and like crazy idea. Let's take classical computing, but add randomness, like uh, augmented with randomness. Okay, so this was their uh, amazing idea. And this is a very simple extension of the model in some sense. And so you take like deterministic, you know, computing like code, such as you're used to, or if you're more of a, um, you know, an electrical engineer type person, uh, circuits. You just like regular old computing and add one, augmented in with one instruction, which is like, you know, a new coin flip instruction. Okay, and what is this? Just um, you know, by definition, this new instruction, you know, it's like a little function that returns zero with probability a half and one with probability a half. Okay, so you're like, great, I allow myself this instruction and now, like, what can I do? And actually, before I ask, you know, uh, the question of what can we do, we could ask a, a question, which we're actually going to again ask ourselves with quantum, like, well, can I actually do this in physical reality? I mean, it's no problem really to mathematically model this and see what you can get out of it. But, you know, in life you would like to correspond to some physical reality and like, what are you going to like take a normal machine and put like a robotic arm that flips coins in it? Or are you going to like, you know, hook up a camera to a lava lamp and try to get like random bits out of it or something like this? It's a bit of an interesting philosophical and uh, physics question of whether you can actually get truly random bits in nature. And Ironically, it seems that in principle the answer is yes because of quantum mechanics. Apparently quantum mechanics is inherently probabilistic. But anyway, let's not worry about that too much because in fact in practice it seems it's not a big deal. Like in practice we have like physical pseudo randomish number generators that seem good and we actually have a well developed theory of pseudo random number generators and like basically everything seems fine if you just use the pseudo random generators that are in your favorite programming language. So fine, let's just go with it. Um, okay, but having uh, proposed this model, you can, you know, ask the question, you know, does this somehow give us more power fundamentally than we had with just good old deterministic computing? So let me ask that question, you know, is probabilistic computing somehow 
This maybe stands for more powerful in some sense, you know, classical deterministic computing. OK, and there's a certain sense. I mean, one can give a certain answer. That's just, um, well, yes, sort of by definition. And you know, it depends in some sense on what the task is. So like, suppose you know, I propose a computational task of output five truly random bits. Well, then OK, by definition, a probabilistic computer can do this. And by like, definition, a deterministic computer cannot do this. OK? You know, if the task is literally like simulate something random, like do a Monte Carlo simulation of this physical process, or um, choose a random 1,024-bit prime, which is a task you always want to do whenever you're doing encryption and stuff. You know, you want your secret keys to be random. A deterministic secret key is not very smart. Then, I mean, by definition, a probabilistic computer can do it, and a deterministic computer cannot do it. So, okay, that's that's fine. Um, but you know, you might want to make uh, you know put things on the same footing, like be a little bit fair to deterministic computing, and uh, you know, give them the same sorts of problems. And so, in a, another sense, there's an answer, a different answer, which is that maybe not, particular for when you're just computing functions, right? If the task is, you know, output three random bits, then fine. You know, there's nothing a deterministic piece of code can do. But what if the task is like the more normal computational task of, you know, you have some function that you're trying to implement that has like a deterministic answer, just try to do it. So, I mean, I'm talking about here like things like, you know, multiply two numbers together, which is a problem we spent some time talking about in the last lecture. Or test if a given number is a prime. It's also an important task for cryptography. Or, you know, if you know about this stuff, you know, compute the minimum spanning tree in a weighted graph. Okay? These are all just, you know, computer function tasks that, you know, have one fixed answer. And that puts the, the problem, you know, equal footing for probabilistic and deterministic computation. And we can ask, you know, could probabilistic computation be more powerful in some sense? And deterministic computation. Now, of course, what after does means a little bit. I mean, uh, how how could it be more powerful? What do you even mean by this? And why would you want to use a probabilistic computation in order to solve like a deterministic problem like this? And uh, the short answer to that is potentially the probabilistic computation could be faster or more efficient in some other way. That's uh, what you might hope for. Now, of course, there's got to be a downside and um, it's important we talk about this a little bit. The nature of a probabilistic computation is that it has a chance of making an error, getting the wrong answer. Okay? If you, you know, want to compute a function in a fixed time bound and have a 100% chance of getting it right, then you know, you're basically asking for a deterministic computation. Okay? So I mean, uh, if you want to try to get something new, you have to allow your probabilistic um, algorithms to have some chance of failure. Um, on the other hand, and this was explored a little bit in uh, the homework that you may be working on, um, having a small chance of failure for your algorithm should not be viewed as a big deal. I mean, as you, you probably know or we'll see, if you have an algorithm like this and you repeat it a bunch of times, you know, you'll lose a little efficiency for having to repeat it a bunch of times, but you can drive down this error probability exponentially small. Okay, so if you have a probabilistic algorithm that fails, it gives the wrong answer with probably 2 to the minus 500, that's perfectly fine. Like 2 to the 500 is like an unphysical quantity. It will literally never happen in our universe. So even though it's a non-zero chance of failure, you don't have to worry about it. So you know, the, the dream for why you might want to use um, probabilistic computing, the potential merit is you know, trading you know, failure probability or error for efficiency. Okay, this is what you may hope for with probabilistic computation. Um, great. And it turns out, as you probably already know, that um, you can do this sometimes. You know, get a fairly big speed up for a, like a basic you know, computer function problem uh, while only having you know, a 2 to the minus 500 chance of error. So a good example for this is the topic of, it's written there already, primality testing. 
Okay, so this is the task of, you know, you're given a super long number. Think of it as like a 1,024-bit number. Okay, and you want to know, is it a prime number? And this is a task that you often need to do in, in cryptographic schemes that are based on number theoretic things. Okay, actually, okay, let me be a little bit more general and call this an n bit number, but n equals 1,000 is a plausible value. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about the history of this computational task. Um, first of all, it's far from obvious, I mean, if you haven't seen it before, that this is a problem that can be solved in P, that can be solved with a polynomial number, a polynomial and n number of steps. I mean, in particular, if you think about the naive algorithm, which is similar to the problem of factoring, it would seem, you know, you see if it's divisible by 2, see if it's divisible by 3, 5, 7, etc. And if you do this, you might have to go up to divisibility by the square root of the number, which is square root 2 to the n, which is 2 to the n over 2, which is like an exponential quantity. You can never do this if n is 1,000. But it turns out there are like actually very clever, sophisticated algorithms for efficiently determining whether a number is prime. We're pretty efficiently determining them. Uh, so this started out with um, Gary Miller in 1976. Gary Miller is a professor here at CMU. You probably know him. And uh, I think this was his PhD thesis. And here's what he showed. Uh, he showed assuming the extended Riemann hypothesis, which is a conjecture from number theory. It's kind of like the P versus NP conjecture of number theory. It's a very, very, very well-believed hypothesis, but it famously nobody knows how to prove it. If you assume this number theory conjecture, he gave an algorithm for primality testing that takes about n to the four steps to test if an n-bit number is prime. Okay? And in particular, this means, under this uh, Riemann hypothesis assumption, that you know, the problem of primality testing is in P, polynomial time. Or as I also like to think about it in this class, it's like physically plausible. You know, if n is 1,000, this is um, a trillion. And a trillion is fine, okay? A trillion steps can be done in one second on like a medium computer, maybe. Okay, so that's good. You know, you can test if this big number is prime in one second on a computer. Which is not super amazing because, you know, if this is a component of like encryption or like going to, you know, HTTPS, if you have to do this whenever you hit a web page, if it takes one second, that's a little annoying. It's not horrible though. So this is very, this is a very great result. Aha, but now, probabilistic computing. So um, the next thing that happened is really kind of like the Shor's algorithm of probabilistic computing. So in 1977, two people, Solvay and Strassen, uh, they gave a probabilistic algorithm, you know, with a very small error probability for testing primality, which used uh, on the order of n cube steps. And I think this you know, is really amazing. It's like a wow. It's, it really was like you know the Shor's algorithm of probabilistic computing. Like maybe prior to this, people thought probabilistic computing was just like a goof. Like who really cared about it? But now look, they took this fundamental problem, primality testing, and they did it way faster. Now, you know, a very theoretically minded person might say, "Well, this is already known. This is polynomial time. This is one polynomial. This is a different polynomial." But it makes a difference, right? I mean, the ratio between n to the fourth and n to the third is n, which is maybe 1,000 or 2,000. So speeding this test up by a factor of 1,000 is pretty awesome, right? Like now it takes a millisecond instead of a second to determine if this huge number is prime. So I think it was really genuinely amazing, and it's like particularly amazing that, you know, they use probability to solve this inherently not probabilistic task. Does it assume ERH? No, this is unconditional. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's something like uh, uh, maybe like kn steps, you get like error 2 to the minus k. 
Okay, so maybe if you really want the error to be like 2 to the minus 500, you like lose a factor of 500 again, but still pretty good. Like maybe 2 to the minus 30 is also fine, and then, you know. But uh, Miller's algorithm is uh, um, guaranteed to be correct. Correct. Hmm? I mean, but why, why there's no such, I mean, is there some implementation of Miller's algorithm? Because like from, from my perspective, this is like very doable. And like we, we should be using this to crack all this encryption. Well, testing of another is primality is not going to help you crack any encryption. It's going to help you help you do the encryption. Yeah, but I'll tell you what people actually do in the next uh, thing I say. Yes. Does finding a counterexample of Miller's algorithm not working imply that ERH is false? Um. Yeah. I mean, in the sense that, like, you know, if Miller's algorithm is not completely a correct test, then ERH is false. Okay, so good questions. Uh, great, so what happened next? Another you know, very nice thing happened. Uh, Rabin, in 1980, he basically you know, looked back at Miller's test, and it's quite easy to see, actually, that instead of relying on the Riemann hypothesis, you can just use randomness for something, um, much like they did. So it was, he kind of just did a riff on Miller, a probabilistic one, so probabilistic riff on Miller's algorithm, and uh, together this probabilistic riff is called the uh, Miller-Raven algorithm for testing primality. And it, uh, it's probabilistic, and it runs in about n squared steps. Okay, And there's no assumption of ERH. It's unconditionally has its property, probably like this property with the trade-off between error and efficiency. Um, right, it works in n squared steps. So this is even better, right? Now, like, if you do this, you can test if a number of this size is prime in, like, a microsecond on a computer. And that's really great. Now you're happy to do it, you know, thousands of times a second. And indeed, like, whenever people try to test if a giant number is prime, they use this algorithm. Uh, great. So there's one more uh, follow-up event in this story from 2002. Um, I still remember in 2002, I was like in my office in grad school, and like Amit Sahai walked into my office with this like paper, and he's like, did you see this yet? <laughs> and uh, it was an algorithm by uh, Agarwal, Kyle, and Saxena, and they gave a deterministic uh, algorithm for primality testing, which is provably, I say this in the sense, meaning it doesn't rely on any conjecture. It doesn't rely on Riemann hypothesis or anything. Probably uh, solves the problem in about n to the 12 steps. Okay, so theoretical computer scientists were super excited because it, you know, officially meant the problem was in p, because it's like a polynomial time algorithm, deterministic, and you know, no assumptions or anything. And in fact, later Lenstra and Pomerantz. We improved this algorithm to like n to the six steps, basically. So that's uh, good. Well, I mean, n to the six steps is like not so amazing. Like for n to the six steps, if you do it on a thousand bit out numbers, like maybe now it'll take your basic computer a week to test if a number is prime or not. That's not awesome. It's not the worst thing in the world, though. It's still you know a physical amount of time. It's still a p algorithm. So. Uh, yeah, this is the state of affairs for primality, and there's actually a range of different things going on here, like is it probabilistic, is it deterministic, is it probably a correct algorithm, uh, up to an assumption, but this is the state of affairs. Uh, great, so in fact on the topic of probabilistic computing, um, there are many important interesting tasks that we know how to do in P, the polynomial number of steps deterministically, uh, but we know how to do them more efficiently in P, probabilistically. So primality is a very good example of this. I mean, if you don't want to rely on any unproven assumptions, then it's you know, n squared versus n to the sixth for primality. And there are many, many problems like this that are important. I should say, of course, you know, this is a sense in which you know, probabilistic computing is better than deterministic computing. Um, I should emphasize it's like a de facto case because we don't provably know that there isn't a deterministic n squared time algorithm for primality, but based on the things we do know, probabilistic computing is more powerful here. 
Okay. Uh, there are like one or two problems with the following property. We know how to do them in P, in polynomial number of steps probabilistically, and we don't provably know how to do them in P deterministically. That was like maybe the situation for a primality testing uh, prior to this paper. Um, okay. But for these problems, even these like one or two problems, we have uh, an algorithm that's deterministic and takes polynomial steps which we believe works. It's just also subject to some hypothesis that we currently don't know how to prove. However, and let me write this on the board, um, for all problems of this type, just like, you know, compute a function problem, we strongly believe, and the, you know, the theoretical computer scientists have very good evidence to believe um, the following. So a strongly believed conjecture Um, every problem that's in P probabilistically is also in P deterministically. Okay, so for every problem which we can solve in a polynomial number of steps using probabilistic computing, we can also uh, solve in a polynomial of steps using just deterministic computing. Um, so this is actually basically the de facto case for almost all interesting problems except for one or two. And uh, basically the reason is, you know, pseudo random number generators seem to be good. So like in practice they seem to be good. We have like very strong theoretical evidence that one can design a pseudo random number generator that will de-randomize any probabilistic algorithm. You know, the evidence in favor of that is related to our belief that P does not equal NP, which is another thing we strongly believe. So basically the summary is we don't believe that probabilistic computing can give us like exponential speed up on any problem of the type, you know, compute this function. But it does seem to give some polynomial speed ups, like the difference between, you know, n squared and n to the fourth, and that's also very good. Any questions? What's your opinion on whether <coughs> like polynomial speed ups exist? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know if there's a definitive opinion, but I guess people would mostly wager that they do exist. There are some problems that you can solve in a like genuinely faster polynomial time probabilistically than deterministically. Uh, but no I'm not proofs, right? Pardon me? No proofs. No, 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 no proofs. But I guess people would kind of believe that. Almost just even based on like the fact that like there are many problems where de facto we have that situation like we know how to do it kind of pretty efficiently random with randomized computation and we just don't know how to do it as efficiently without randomized computation. Uh, for example, the MST problem that I mentioned has this property. Uh, we know a truly linear time algorithm. If I got this right, a truly linear time probabilistic algorithm, and not we don't know if there is such a thing deterministically. Okay, remember this is all an extended par parable. Well, it's, it's true, but it's extended parallel for quantum computation. But let me now write a long summary of what I've told you about probabilistic computation. Okay, so I'll do this in bullet point format. So first thing about probabilistic computation is that it's cool, you know? It's great. Uh, it leads us to like way more efficient algorithms for lots of problems. It's fun. You know, every first year computer scientist should learn about it. It's good stuff. Um, you can kind of really think about it. It's, it's like classical computing, classical meaning deterministic here, you know, plus one extra power. You know, the ability to flip coins or get random 0, 1 bits. Uh, the next bullet point is that sort of its quintessential use is, you know, simulating a random phenomena. 
This is what I talked about a little bit when I said, you know, if your task is to like output five random bits, probabilistic computing is great for that, and deterministic computing is not. Okay, so you know, doing Monte Carlo simulations and so forth, that's like the most obvious and canonical use for probabilistic computing. Okay. Uh, okay, the next bullet point I want to talk about, we just finished talking about, which is that, um, you know, it gives uh, speed ups, you know, over deterministic computing. At the level of, you know, from one P algorithm, polytime algorithm, to another, to a better one, for many problems, and many nice problems. Any tasks? And again, you know, I should put a little asterisk here because in every case, it's not like we know for sure there's no deterministic algorithm that. It's comparable in speed to the randomized one. It's just, in practice, we don't know one. Uh, OK. And the other bullet point, uh, well, I'll just leave it up here. It's, it's basically this. So I'll say it in words. Um, it's strongly believed that it doesn't give exponential speed ups for any problem of this computer function type. Let me just. Emphasize that a little bit here. For these computer function tasks where deterministic and probabilistic um, algorithms are potentially on the same footing. Okay, so that's a, sort of a summary of probabilistic quantum computer probabilistic computing. Actually, let me there's space for one more bullet point, so let me put it in here. Uh, consider the following probabilistic code. You're all used to probabilistic code probably, so here, here are some. Um, initialize um, an array A of length 1,000. And then uh, do this code for i goes from 1 to 1,000. Fill in AI with a random bit. Okay, so so far this code just picks a thousand random bits. And then imagine there are more lines here that just, you know, do some deterministic computation involving A, just some algorithm that's deterministic and, you know, accesses A and does various things. Okay, suppose you did such code, and the only thing I want to say here is that um, at the end, or rather not at the end, but like if I asked you, don't run this code, but just look at this code and mathematically analyze it and tell me like a description of the state of the array at the end of the code, you know, the state of A at the end of the code is defined by 2 to the 1,000 numbers. What 2,000 numbers? I mean the, the probabilities of uh, that A, the array A ends up in each of the 2 to the 1,000 possibilities. Right? The 2 to the 1,000 different possible final outcomes for the whole array and it's randomized code, so each one has some probability. So the description of these probabilities is 2 to the 1,000 numbers. OK, any questions? And by the way, if you started the homework, uh, there's a couple problems at the end. In some sense, one of them is kind of like, um, you know, do this kind of thing by just simulating uh, the code and getting a trial run. So I'll have different probabilistic outcomes. And then like the follow-up problem is sort of like do this computation, like just given the code, like compute all these 2 to the 1,000. Well, in your case, it'll be like 2 to the 5 numbers. 
Okay, so that's the, the um, summary of probabilistic computing. And as you might guess, like I will now make the analogy to quantum computing. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you about quantum computing. Okay, so it's cool. Check. Same. Uh, it's like classical computation plus one extra power. Actually, yes, check. So actually, this is what I want to get to in this lecture. This is what the slogan, rotate, compute, rotate, is all about. There is a way in which quantum computing is just you take classical computing and you add like one extra power. It's more complicated than a coin flip, but we'll see what it is. Uh, let's see. Quintessential use of a quantum computer is simulating some quantum phenomenon. So actually, let me take you a little time out before I you know, make all the parallels here to tell you a story about the history of quantum computing. Uh, so I talked a lot last time about David Deutsch, and I just said he was sort of one of the co-founders of quantum computing. And the other co-founder of quantum com computing is traditionally held to be Richard Feynman, the famous physicist. And uh, why? Well, in the early 80s, he gave some talks where he sort of made the following observations. He was a physicist, right? So I mean, his main interest was, you know, like theoretical physicist, but like doing experiments and trying to develop tools to calculate and predict what will happen in quantum phenomena. Like if you get three hydrogen atoms together, like what will the electrons do under these circumstances? And you know, it's well recognized that let's say if you're trying to predict what will happen if you have a thousand photons or electrons together, you need to keep track of two to the one thousand numbers, these amplitudes that describe their state. You know, you recognize that like that it makes calculations on paper very difficult. It also makes calculations very difficult on a computer, even if you're willing to use your 1980s era computer to try to simulate this. I mean, you just can't. You can't sort two to the 1,000 numbers. So, okay, physicists tried to come up with you know heuristics and other things, but you know, he said we have this fundamental difficulty. Like, we can't seem to get our computers to simulate quantum systems. So, the particles though. They're doing it. Like the particles themselves are doing it. They're kind of like simulating themselves, if you will. So why not just regard those particles as being part of the computer? And then sort of by definition, they can do the simulation. Right? It's like if you're like trying to, I don't know, flip coins and you just say, oh, let's just get that robotic coin flipping arm and like call it part of the computer and ta-da, now we have like a, a, a computer that's probabilistic and it can like perfectly simulate flipping coins. So this was his idea. Like, just get the quantum particles to be part of the computer, and then you can, by definition, simulate quantum phenomena. This is something you cannot seem to do with a classical computer. Yeah, so that's a pretty good idea. And uh, he did not take it to the next level of asking, well, what else could we do with it? And can it simulate general computation and other kind of computation? But that was a very good idea. OK, good. So uh, yeah, we're to here. Um, good, so what about this one? Uh, quantum computing gives speedups over deterministic, and in fact, I'll even upgrade this to probabilistic. Computing from one level of P to another for many problems. This is still exactly true of quantum computing. Um, the most famous example is like a Grover's algorithm, which we'll eventually talk to uh, talk about. Uh, at a high level, it's solving this problem, like you're given an array of length n with one one in it somewhere, and the rest of the entries are zero. Find that position of the one. And with randomized or deterministic computation, it takes you, I don't know, about n or n over two steps. And a quantum computer can do it in square root of n steps. So there's a big difference between square root n and n. You know, if n is 1,000, that's like another factor 30 speed up. On the other hand, they're polynomially related quantities. N is the square of square root N. Uh, but that's great, and it's a very general problem. And in general, you can use that and other ideas to get you know, speed ups with a quantum computer from one level of polynomial time to a better level of polynomial time for many problems. Mm -hmm. Is that problem a fair problem to compare on? Because like, for probabilistic, you can have like given an array where exactly half of the ones find at least one of those ones. That one is like not fair for probabilistic computing. Well, that's an example where like probabilistic computing can do it like super efficiently and deterministic cannot. It's a bit funny because like 
there's some aspect of like the input having a promise property, like your promise is not any old input. So in fact, the way I prefer to think about Grover's algorithm, or a way that I like to think about Grover's algorithm, which is different from what I just said, is think about an algorithm for the SAT problem. If you know the famous NP-complete problem SAT, the fastest deterministic algorithm and fastest probabilistic algorithm we kind of know for this problem takes about two to the n steps, just brute force, try all the inputs and see if one's satisfying. And with a quantum computer using Grover, you can do it in square root of two to the n time. So like 1.4 to the n time, which is way better. 1.4 to the n is way, way better than two to the n. They're both exponential and actually they're polynomially related to each other, but that's like a very clear cut problem, like a very famous problem set where quantum computers get like a big, albeit still only polynomial speed up. Okay, so this is all these bullet points, kind of similar. Now things are going to get like slightly different between quantum computing and classical computing. In particular, the analog, the analog of this claim is not really correct by virtue of Shor's algorithm, as we talked about last time. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, what would you just said? Like, we can solve subsets on two to the n over two, like you said, and we can use that to sat in polynomial time, so can't sat also be solved in two to the n over two anyway? Ah, oh, that's a good question. Does anybody know the resolution of that issue? So, the question was uh, subset sum, I, I think you're right, uh, that you can solve it in time two to the n over two. And we know it's NP hard, so uh, sat can be reduced to it. So doesn't that mean we can also, in polynomial time, doesn't that mean we can also reduce, solve sat in two to the n over two time? What about the reduction costs? It's a polynomial time reduction. Ah, yes, so it's a polynomial time reduction, so that's not a problem, but there's another aspect to the reduction, which is it makes the length bigger. So subset sum instances of length n, sorry, sad instances of length n will get blown up to subset sum instances of length perhaps 100 times n. And so then if you can do 2 to the 100 n over 2, that's okay, but it's not saving you. Yep, Ex excellent point though. Okay, so let's talk about whether quantum computers can get a uh, speed up. Uh, it's sort of an exponential speed up over classical, including probabilistic computing, and it seems they can. So it seems uh, that you know quantum computing does give exponential speed up. over you know, classical or even probabilistic computing for at least one very famous and important problem, factoring. Now again, I put seams in quotes because I emphasized last time, it's not like we know for sure there's no polynomial time, like efficient algorithm for factoring. So we can't like definitively say, oh, because of this, quantum computing does give exponential speed ups, provably, for some important problems. But uh, de facto it does. We don't know a polynomial time algorithm for factoring. Many people believe there isn't a polynomial time algorithm, classical algorithm for factoring. So this is great. And it's a sense in which like, quantum computing is even better than probabilistic computing was. Uh, that's one very famous problem where we get an exponential speed up, factoring. Um, you know, everybody always asks, like, how about some more problems where quantum computing gets exponential speed up? Yeah, I mean, people who really fervently want to like defend quantum computing, like, at every turn will say, like, oh yes, there are many other problems where this happens, but like, there's some other problems which are not that famous, where quantum computing gives an exponential speed up over classical computing, as far as we know, but they're not that famous. Um, so factoring is the best example for sure. Great. Now, factoring is a very interesting problem. You know, I kind of said it, or intimated, it's like one of the few problems where quantum computing we really think gives like an exponential speed up, you know, taking for it, things from the realm of the unphysically possible to the physically possible. Um, what about for other problems like uh, SAT or NP-complete problems, for example. Factoring is famously one of these problems where it seems hard, but it also doesn't seem to be NP-complete. And uh, in fact, I'll tell you one more fact about quantum computing. It's strongly believed 
that quantum computing does not give exponential speed up for many problems, in particular for NP complete problems like SAD and for other problems. Uh, we will see some in the course of this uh, course. I'll tell you about intuition and why people believe this um, some lectures from now. But uh, one should bear this in mind, right? When there's a lot of hype about quantum computing, it's believed that it doesn't solve things ex like you know, SAD and other NP-complete problems um, in better than exponential time. And in particular, that should make you a little wary or remind, you should remind yourself of that fact when you kind of maybe caricature quantum computing as like, oh, you just get like 10 to the 500 parallel universes for free and you can just like do all, you know, parallel as many computations as you want in like a short amount of time and like automatically solve problems this way. It doesn't work like that. Maybe there are 10 to the 500 parallel universes, but in order to make them work for you, you have to be very careful and like occasionally you can get them to work for you in such a way that you can solve factoring efficiently, but we don't think you can do it to solve SAT or other NP-complete problems efficiently. Yep? Um, is there proof for this for probabilistic computing or is it also still something that's just strong complete? It's a good question. The NP, for example, the, the P versus NP problem, which you probably know about, is saying that um, there's no deterministic polynomial time algorithms for solving NP-complete problems. That's extremely widely believed. Uh, there's a broader question about what about probabilistic computing? It would be called the NP versus BPP problem. And uh, it's basically equally widely believed. I mean, in the sense uh, that anybody that believes P does not equal NP, which is most people, equally well believes that probabilistic computing doesn't help. Yeah? So, I have a very rudimentary understanding of P versus NP, but um, wouldn't factoring, at least the way we currently see it now, um, seem to belong in a similar class where we can easily verify it, but can't really easily factor it? It's uh, a good question. It's about the status of factoring vis-a-vis -vis NP and NP completeness. So, um, one needs to review a little bit complexity theory in order to understand this precisely. Uh, so, I hope you will, but the short answer is that uh, factoring is a problem that's in NP, but it's not NP complete, or at least we don't know that it's NP complete and we don't believe that it's NP complete. So it's in the class NP, but it's not as hard as all the NP complete problems like SAT and subset sum and Hamiltonian path and so forth. Okay, so the last uh, analog I want to say since we have this up on the board is the following. Uh, I'm going to describe for you some quantum computing code at a very high level. So quantum computing kind of looks like this. Initialize 1,000 photons. So get together 1,000 photons in like a fixed uh, state in your refrigerator or your apparatus. Uh, these are going to be qubits. And then you like do some computation to them, which if they're photons is something like you physically run them through like an obstacle course of like mirrors and prisms and um, lasers and stuff. Okay, etc. And uh, that changes their state in a way that you've sort of designed because you designed that obstacle course. And that's sort of like this part actually. And now it's again true that the state of the photons at the end of this obstacle course is defined by 2 to the 1,000 numbers. I mentioned this last time. These are called, uh, these are not the probabilities of the 2 to the 1,000 bit strings, but they're called amplitudes of the 2 to the 1,000 bit strings. They're kind of like probabilities. Although, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the class, they can be negative. In fact, they can even be complex numbers. But it's a similar thing where these numbers uh, define the state of the thousand photons, a thousand qubits at the end of the computation. But there's one difference which is a little bit hard for me to explain. So maybe you come back to this lecture or you'll understand what I mean more later. Um, unlike with the coins, the coins like when we said that the state, the end, was defined by 2 to the 1,000 numbers, which were probabilities, 
that was kind of like, those two to the 1,000 probabilities represented our theoretical analysis of what could happen had we run the experiment. Or you might say it's had we actually done the code but like not looked at the answer yet, the 2 to the 1,000 probabilities would reflect our lack of knowledge about what the truth was. But in physical reality, when you're flipping the coins, they actually have a definite state. Maybe just you haven't looked at that state yet, or maybe you haven't actually done the experiment yet, but they have some physical state. Maybe you just don't know what it is if you haven't looked at them yet. Okay. In contrast, in quantum computing, these 2 to the 1,000 numbers do not reflect any lack of knowledge of the state. I mean, the true state of the photons can only be described by these 2 to the 1,000 numbers, even after the experiment has been run. Like, it's not like they're secretly in some 1,000-bit state and you just don't know which one. This is the definition of their state. So again, it's a little hard to appreciate. You'll eventually maybe understand this better. But it's sort of like in those two homework problems, the first one doesn't make sense for a quantum computer. You cannot do it. Like the only way to describe the state at the end is by the full set of amplitudes for the 2 to the 1,000 uh, different strings. Before measurement. That's right, before measurement. I mean, I'll talk about measurement actually a little bit more in this lecture. Yeah? Yeah, so when you say initialize 1,000 photons, yes. does those photons have a very precise fixed state that you want? Uh, yes, if you're good at uh, experimental physics, then yes. You like put them in a fridge or something, or actually you measure them like many, many times, and basically we assume theoretically, and it also seems to be true practically, that you can get them into a fixed known state at the beginning. But like fixed known state, but not a fixed state you want beforehand. No, a fixed state you want beforehand. Okay. Basically the state that uh, you know, only one of these amplitudes is non-zero. The all zero string is somehow how they're, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I will now, I told you some facts about quantum computing, I'll now try to describe like quantum computing from the point of view of like, I can now tell you that one extra power that quantum computers have over classical computers. It will be at a very high level and uh, we'll do it properly later, but that's what I want to try to talk about now as a sketch. The one extra power of quantum computers. It, um, you know, there's like these series on like YouTube where it's like one person tries to explain the same concept like five different ways at like differing levels of expertise. Actually, they have one for quantum, which is fine, but I'm going to do a different one for this topic. You know, five different explanations of the one extra power that quantum computers have. So if I had to explain it to a four-year-old, here's what I would say. Uh, the one extra power that uh, quantum computers have is finding patterns in data. Actually, maybe data is not such a good word for a four-year-old. So I'll, I'll alter data to um, lists of numbers. Okay, a a four-year-old can know what a list of numbers is. Right? So finding patterns in lists of numbers. Okay, so if I had to tell a four-year-old or a journalist what I thought was like the <laughs> one <laughs> uh, extra power that quantum computers have, it's this, finding patterns in lists of numbers. But if I had to tell an eight-year-old, well, I wouldn't change it too much, but one thing is to make this part a little bit more honest, I would sort of change this word to getting clues about. And I would leave this, but I would add a word here. I would add the word long, very long lists of numbers, like e.g. length 10 to the 500. Okay, that's what I would tell an eight-year-old a quantum computer can do. Okay. okay, let's upgrade it to the, the third level of explanation, the high schooler. And uh, already the high schooler might ask a question, which is probably also on your mind, which is I just spent like the whole last lecture trying to convince you that like this is a totally unphysical number and you cannot have in physical reality a list of length 10 to the 500. So what does this possibly mean? So for the high schooler, I would add just two words uh, which are implicitly represented. 
Okay, so I chose this phrase very carefully. Okay, so quantum computer, it's one power. He's finding or getting clues about patterns in very long lists of numbers where the lists are implicitly represented. And they have to be implicitly represented. They cannot be explicitly represented because there's not space in the universe for 10 to the 500 numbers physically laid out. So let me elaborate on what I mean by this. Okay, so uh, what I mean by an implicitly represented list. So, well, a list of numbers kind of looks like this. It's like an array. It's got a list. It's got slots. You know, slot 0, slot 1, slot 2, slot 3, hypothetically up to slot 10 to the 500. And it's got some numbers in it, like 20, 18, negative 42, et cetera. And in general, what I'll, I'll say is like a general slot, I'll call the name of that slot x. And I'll call the, you know, the number in that slot f of x. Okay? And what is x? Okay, it's a number between uh, 0 and 10 to the 500. Actually, for whatever reason, let me change this to another very big number, 2 to the 1,000. Okay, it's also very big. So remember, the name x is perfectly fine, right? The, the name of the slot is represented by 1,000 bits, okay? So like, it's like uh, 125k. So it's no problem to physically write down the name of the slot, but to write actual down the whole list of 2 to the 1,000 numbers, that's not possible. And uh, still, this is just a setup. I mean, how is this list implicitly represented? It's just um, f is given by some code. I don't know, some Python program or something. All right? So it's like it's implicitly represented in the sense that you, know, you have some function, some code, that you know, takes as input x. This is some 1,000 bits. And you know, computes <coughs> via normal classical computing, uh, some you know, entry is the x number in list, and then you know, return entry. Okay, so you just imagine that you have a you know, normal piece of computer code, or if you're more like an electrical engineer than a software engineer, you might imagine you have um, some computer chip or computer circuit that has a thousand bit input, and then some ands and or gates, and then it has you know, some bits to represent the output. But in this way, you can implicitly represent a list of 2 to the 1,000 numbers. Okay, so a mathematician would maybe also just think, okay, what's going on here is f is a function that maps this extremely large number of numbers into, I don't know, data, the integers, let's say. Ah, let's make it the reals. Ah, let's make it the complex numbers. Okay. Maybe this, this list of numbers has complex numbers in it. Yeah. Is the function deterministic? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's say it is. Ultimately, it could actually be probabilistic, but let's just say it's deterministic. <coughs> okay. So that's the end of what I tell the high schooler. I would explain how you could implicitly represent two to the five hundred or two to the thousand, you know, numbers, representing some data, and then the quantum computer is really good about getting clues at patterns in the data. Okay, so the fourth. Uh, so, um, is, uh, is, is any of this uh, list representable by a function? I mean, like, maybe for, for, for some list, the, 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 the space to store this function can be very huge. Okay. Yes, it's not true that every possible list like this can be implicitly represented by like a simple piece of computer code that you could write down on a piece of paper yeah. or in a physical universe. Yeah. But, uh, well, the list of numbers that we do tend to care about have, often have this property. So, yeah, we do assume that it's implicitly represented by, if you want some computer science terminology, like a, let's say, polynomial time computable function. Okay, so fourth level of explanation is for the undergraduate. Okay, and now, now, of course, we have to get serious about what we mean by pattern. That's the obvious kind of vague spot. And uh, basically, patterns, you know, Forget I said patterns. Instead, let's talk about the discrete Fourier transform. And this is where it gets serious. Um, right, so probably you heard about the discrete Fourier transform a little. Maybe you are an expert in the discrete Fourier transform. Maybe you only have a vague notion of what it is. Don't worry, we're going to be talking about it a lot in this course. You'll, you'll know a lot about it after the end. 
Uh, but I'll now give you another like super high level vague uh, reminder slash picture of what Fourier transforms are. You, I, I'm sure you know that they're very important uh, concept algorithm. Okay, so what is the, this? Let's say you, uh, to explain it at a high level, let's say you smash your fingers down on some piano notes. Actually, let's make it a synthesizer instead of a piano because I think pianos have like overtones or something that will ruin this explanation. Uh, so it makes a sound. Let's say you just press one key. Then, uh, again, reminder, I don't know anything about physics. I, I think that like, what happens is like the air pressure like, near the synthesizer like, changes. And you know, it changes like this. Okay? It makes like, one of these like, sine waves if you press like, just one key. And yeah, this is, I guess the height is like relative air pressure or something. And this is maybe time is this axis. And then you know, this, the value of this relative air pressure is like some f of t. It's like a height. Okay? And what does the Fourier transform do when you apply it to this signal? Um, well, in general, the Fourier transform kind of decomposes it into some basic frequencies. This is all kind of jargon. And um, these frequencies are like sines and cosines. And in fact, like, this is just like the plainest case where it's like one frequency. So somehow, the Fourier transform of this function is another function called f hat m. And in this particular case, it, it's the function that maybe looks like this. Or this is some particular thing, like 440 hertz. OK, I only want you to understand this picture at a vague level. That's the only level I have myself. Uh, good, so that's if you press like one pure tone, one key. If you really actually you know, mash the keyboard, then Maybe that it's more complicated looking curve you get that somehow it's like this, and if you just hold it down, it'll kind of repeat in a periodic way over time. So what's the y-axis in the second half? Uh, maybe somehow like volume or like intensity of this. Does anybody know the correct word? Frequency. The horizontal axis is the frequency. I don't know what the height is. Like the uh, amplitude. Yes, it's amplitude. Very good. Amplitude. Yeah, the amplitude of this. What's the y-axis in the first Somebody? It's the same thing? It's the same thing? I don't think it's guaranteed that the amplitudes are the same value, but they're, they're both on the amplitude scale. Both yeah. Functions. I come at this from a mathematical perspective where like this is one function, and this is some other function, but yeah, something like that. I encourage you to find out and then tell me. Right, so uh, what does the Fourier transform do here? It kind of decomposes, I mean, the Fourier transform in, in math, engineering, and this acoustics is like it's trying to, this is actually some linear combination of pure sine waves of different like frequencies. You know, the different notes have like different frequencies and like when you add them together, you get some funky looking wave when you play a chord. And like the Fourier transform kind of, um, you know, picks that out. So like maybe if you mashed four different notes at like different strengths, some pressure sensitive synth. <coughs> it might be this function that has, you know, peaks of perhaps differing heights at differing frequencies. Uh, good. In general, in uh, math, uh, there are different kinds of Fourier transforms. They're all kind of similar, they're all closely related, but they depend a little bit on different things like what the domain is, okay? So this picture here is like where the horizontal domain here is continuous, like if continuous time. And then here, like the domain is actually discrete. Um, the discrete Fourier transform, which is the main thing we talk about in quantum computing, is like just a version of this where like the horizontal axis is discretized. So Instead of thinking of the parameter t as like taking a continuum of possible values, like the horizontal axis is like chopped up into some um, capital N different positions, and like f is a function of this dis discrete positions. Uh, so as I said, yeah, there's you know different domains for your Fourier transform. So also, all these plots are as if like the vertical axis is like a real number. In general, it's a complex number, but it's hard to draw a complex number, so I always draw a complex number as if it were a real number. Uh, yeah, this maps to some other Fourier transform. So one domain, that's kind of in the first picture, is um, 
the real numbers or like a real interval. And uh, physicists love this because, I don't know, they think of time as a continuous variable or position as a continuous variable. I and computer scientists hate it because like, you know, you have continuum many variable uh, positions and then you got to know calculus and like measure theory and like there's all sorts of suffering that occurs because this is continuous. But that's what they start with in quantum mechanics textbooks, which is a shame. Uh, but we prefer and find simpler to do the discretized version. So uh, the discrete domain is when you chop up the horizontal domain into little gaps like this. And so in this case, like the domain is like, you know, just the integers modulo capital N for some very large N. Okay, and try to make sense of this. This capital N will generally be 2 to the little n, where little n is the number of particles involved. That might not make sense yet, but we'll see. And uh, for Fourier transforms where this is the domain, um, just functions exactly like this. Uh, the, the frequencies that, the frequencies are like discrete or discretized sines and coses. Okay, so the Fourier transform in this world is like trying to take a discrete signal like this and represent it as a linear combination of different uh, discretized sines and coses. And this is the kind of Fourier transform that comes up in Shor's algorithm. You know, this integer is mod n. It's really related to number theory and factoring. And this is why this Fourier transform is going to be the key ingredient in Shor's algorithm. Uh, there's a third domain, which is actually my personal favorite domain, which is when you think of the, the domain of the function as, in this way, as like, from a computer science perspective, the set of all binary strings. And you think of, you kind of think of this like a computer scientist is like a, a Boolean function, a function on the Boolean cube. And for this kind of, uh, sometimes called the walsh hadamard Fourier transform, the frequencies are XOR functions. So again, this might not precisely make sense if you haven't seen it before. As I said, this is my favorite kind of Fourier transform. I wrote a book about it once. Um, and it's, it's easier. I mean, everybody likes, you know, this simple concept rather than sines and cosines. And uh, it's also easier, as we'll see, for a quantum computer to implement. You just do the, the most basic gate, the Hadamard gate, on all your particles. And uh, Simon's algorithm, which I talked about last time, just like the workhorse, like the one thing that Simon's algorithm does is like this, this Fourier transform. It finds this kind of patterns, XOR function patterns, in an implicitly represented Boolean function. And really, Shor's algorithm just like looked at Simon's algorithm is like, hey, what if we did this kind of Fourier transform instead of this kind? And with more work, you get uh, the factoring algorithm. <coughs> okay, well, now we're truly was at a pretty high level, so perhaps you don't quite get it, but. Um, Right, so what does this have to do with quantum computing, or what am I implying here? Uh, let's forget quantum computing for a second. I mean, just remind ourselves what Fourier transforms are. As I said, they're a very important concept in, in everyday algorithms. And uh, how, what is this transformation? As you may know, right, uh, if you just turn this list of numbers on its side and think of it as a vector, this is your like data or your signal, uh, and you're trying to get out this uh, transform version, the Fourier transform, you know, the amplitudes of the important frequencies, or of all the frequencies. Uh, you get this from this by multiplying by this discrete Fourier transform matrix. Okay, and if you know a little bit about it, this is the thing that has like the roots of unity in it. Okay, if you haven't seen this before, this on the homework, there's a link to me lecturing about this topic and its related relationship to algorithms for multiplying integers. Uh, okay, I just want to you know remind you that if your data has length capital N, then this is a capital N by capital N matrix. And the naive algorithm for doing this transform, taking this signal and producing this result, is a matrix multiplication. 
And this naive algorithm uh, takes about n squared steps. <coughs> I mean, just write down the matrix. That's about n squared steps for multiplying the matrix as well. <coughs> just good. Turns out there's a very famous algorithm called the fast Fourier transform due to Cooley and Tukey from the 60s and also Gauss from an earlier century. Uh, and it does a divide and conquer method for doing this task and it works in about n steps, or maybe n log n steps. Right. So what I'm trying to say here is there's a classical algorithm for computing this discrete Fourier transform of a list of capital N numbers. And uh, not only can you do it in n squared steps, you can even do it in close to n steps. And this is amazing. This is used all the time in every aspect of I don't know, engineering and computer science, this fast Fourier transform, it's like called one of the most important 10 algorithms in the history of algorithms. You know, you can easily do the Fourier transform of a signal of a billion data points, you know, in the blink of an eye. And actually, it's important to do the fast Fourier transform. If you want to do it for with the naive algorithm, a billion squared is pretty big. And that's very wonderful. And uh, long story short, <coughs> Uh, a quantum algorithm, there is a quantum algorithm that does it in about log n steps, log of capital N steps. Particularly what this means, if this is like an implicitly represented list of 2 to the 1,000 numbers, a quantum algorithm in some sense can get this uh, Fourier transform in like a very reasonable number of steps, like a thousand steps. But also somehow implicitly represented? Very good question. Exactly the question I was hoping you would ask. So uh, what does it mean? It gets the answer. First of all, I mean, how does it even get started? Well, with a quantum computer, let's draw the picture. So this is how things go. <coughs> but you're right. It, it does not give you the output explicitly. There's not space in the universe for it to give it to you. It also cannot do the first thing you would hope it could do, which is the quantum computer says, you tell me y, and I'll tell you f hat y. It doesn't do that either. We'll see what it does do. Um, OK, so remember, you know, our, our numbers are implicitly defined by some, like, quantum, or some Python program. And uh, the first step is actually convert it to like a Boolean circuit. That's standard. With the ands and or gates or whatever. Or perhaps you just had f this way in the first place. And then you take this, and there's like a clear and simple way to convert this into like an obstacle course with mirrors and lasers and prisms and things for photons. So this is the quantum computer. And this is a good cartoon. And uh, you, you plug a thousand photons into this quantum computer. And they run through this obstacle course. And at the end of this obstacle course, their state, as I've told you a few times, is defined mathematically by 2 to the 1,000 numbers. And you can cook it up so that those 2 to the 1,000 numbers are exactly the, basically the values of f. Uh, this long list of values of f. f of x? Uh, well, f in the sense that, uh, yeah, so f has 2 to the 1,000 values. Right? Its domain is of size 2 to the 1,000, so it, f is kind of consists of like a truth table of 2 to the 1,000 values. And those values, you get to be the 2 to the 1,000 numbers that define the state of the particles at the end of this. Okay. And then you put a, like another small obstacle course on here, which is about a thousand elements or so forth. And now at this point, the state of the, the two to the one thousand after the particles have gone through this obstacle course, the two to the one thousand numbers defining their state are exactly the values of f hat. Okay, so it looks great. Like these particles, their state, you've, by getting them to go through this obstacle course, have gotten 
to a state where uh, it's defined by a thousand numbers and those thousand two sorry two to the thousand numbers and those are exactly the Fourier transform of f. Oh, that's exactly what I'm coming to. That's exactly what I'm coming to. Is also Alex's question. Now what? In other words, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, in practical reality, it's up to you. Like, the more complicated or the more time steps this f takes, like the bigger this physical circuit would be, and therefore the bigger this physical obstacle course for your photons will be. So in particular, like in order to do this in a practical way, it should be the case that f is a practically computable function, like a polynomial, computing a polynomial time function, for example. Like there's some direct sense in which like the running time of this f goes into like how many physical elements, mirrors, lasers, whatever is you need to put here. We'll see. I mean, it's a bit of a high level, and uh, you might be already trying to jump to like, oh, how can I use this to solve SAT, for example? Like, if you're solving SAT on a circuit C, you're trying to define if a, a circuit you have in your hand is satisfiable. It is true that like a good first move is to like plug it in here. Uh, and in fact, Grover's algorithm starts this way, but then it does some more stuff. But we'll see. Uh, Okay, so now, yeah, it's coming to like the burning uh, question here. Now what? So as I said, of course, these two 1,000 numbers are sort of inside the, the state of the particles, and you cannot, you know, get them all out. You can't write down two to the 1,000 numbers anywhere in physical space. And like the second best thing, as I said, you might hope for is to somehow be able to say like, okay, I want to know what is the value f hat on my favorite number here. 440 or something. Can't do that either. So what can you do? Well, you can measure them. And uh, with like a, another physical device, like a spark chamber, I don't know, something that like measures, let's say, photons. And pretty good measure, let's say, the state of their polarization or their spin or some other physics concept. Say we don't really know the physics, but like the law, the mathematical laws of quantum mechanics just tell you what happens when you measure these photons. And it's a very interesting thing that happens. Um, so like it's usually drawn like this with like a little box that looks like some kind of meter, <laughs> like the meter like spits out something. Uh, you detect uh, some 1,000 bit string, some Y star, okay, which is like the name of a position here. You detect some name of a position here with probability uh, F hat Y star squared. So the small thing I did not tell you, which I will tell you now, um, in quantum mechanics, these two to the 1,000 numbers always have the property that their squares add up to one. So that, therefore, this sentence like makes sense. Okay. Um, in particular, that means that these are unit vectors. Their squares add up to one. So like you take a, a signal, which is a unit vector, and you get out the Fourier transform, which turns out is also a unit vector. So these frequencies, their squares add up to one. So this sentence makes sense. Okay, so you kind of get not your favorite value of the Fourier transform, but you get a sample from the Fourier transform. You kind of get the name of a frequency at a high level, which is a high frequency for your data signal. You know? The Fourier transform again like looks like this. You know, maybe you'll get this one with like 60%, this one with 30%, 20%, and well, that's more than 100%, but <laughs> 60, 10, 10, 10, okay? Uh, so that's the probabilistic aspect of quantum computing. Were you like 
trying to detect y star, or were you trying to detect? No, y yeah. You don't try to detect anything. You just say like, now I want to measure, and like your detector, your detector goes like, y star equals one zero zero one zero one 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 zero a thousand digits. What if you want another value? Very good question. Exactly what I was going to say. What if you want another value? Very good. You can do it again. So one thing that you cannot do is just you know take these photons, they went into a measuring device, and then just put them into another measuring device and another measuring device and do it again. You can't quite do that because this other weird aspect of quantum mechanics, which is that measure. the laws say once you measure them in this way, the state of the particles changes. It changes. It's no longer the state is no longer defined by these two to the one thousand numbers. The state, let me write it over here so there's room. The state, after you measure, snaps to a very trivial state, which I'll, I'll write like this one. It's like a state that looks like almost all the amplitudes are 0, except one of them is 1. It's the state f hat y equals 1 if y star y equals y star these are names of slots 1000 bit strings zero else so it's like once you measure them and you like sort of detect them some detect the, some 1000 bit string it's sort of stuck that way so if you like you measure it again you'll just get the same result now in fact all is not lost because somebody said a thing that you can do which is you can say fine i'll just go back to the beginning here and do this all over again and you'll get a new different sample. So like if this was the picture of f hat, then OK, you'll get you know, this one, another draw from here. So you might probably get this one again, but maybe there's a 10% chance you'll get this one, and so forth. So there's a sense in which you can sample from this um, thing, but it costs you time. Right? If you want 10 samples, you have to run this whole experiment like 10 times. So that's fine, and you know, we'll say you can do it polynomially many times if you want, but you can't like sample so many times that you'll exactly learn all these frequencies. Because anyway, there are two to the one thousand of them, so it's not like you could physically do that. Yeah? Do you detect y and f of y pair, or do you only detect the like, You only detect y, you don't detect the number f of y either. But uh I'm sorry, was that information just gives you an element of your domain? Right, but for example, what it says is let's say you do this experiment like ten times. Now, bear in mind, there's two to the 1,000 different outcomes you could get. But let's say you do it 10 times, and like six of the times, you get like some particular string, like this one. And you probably say, holy cow, it must be the case that the Fourier transform kind of has like a very enormous peak on the, the, the frequency named 010101, like, you know, the sine curve where like this number is the period. Of course, that's going to happen if this is the case, right? I don't know, you run this thing 10 times, like, but from, the scratch. The, from the second time and third time on, you will only get twice time. Ah, uh, no, so, so that's, that's true, but that's if you just, like, take these particles, put them into your spark chamber, and then, like, they fly out the back and you put them into another spark chamber or something. Like, you measure them twice in succession. Oh. You can... No, you can just, like, throw them in the garbage, and then you get, like, a thousand <laughs> new photons from a fridge and put them through this whole thing. Okay, so let me uh, summarize some things. So what, what is this good for? So what it's good for, it's like weakly good for something, right? It's well, like when I said it's about getting clues about patterns in enormous lists of data. These patterns are like the important frequencies that somehow these things sort of tell you about the periodicity in the original data. And so like you kind of, by doing this experiment, you like learn the name of one important frequency or one important frequency component of your original data list. And you sort of learn it with pro probability proportional to the square of its importance in the original data list. Uh, so in particular, uh, let me just add one more thing. Why did I call this whole story rotate, compute, rotate? This free Fourier transform matrix is a rotation operator. I mean, it's, it's an operator. It's a matrix. So it represents like a physical transformation of vectors. And it's one that preserves length. So it's like a rotation slash reflection. And I'm trying to tell you, there's in fact a theorem that says, without loss of generality, 
doing this is like the one thing that a quantum computer can do. It can like take an implicitly represented signal, rotate it by the Fourier transform, and actually you can do this a couple of times. You can do some classical computation to change the signal, rotate it again, do another classical computation to change the signal, rotate it again, and at the end, measure it. And in some sense, without loss of generality, that's quantum computing. Uh, so, one sec. So the last thing I'll say is, you know, actually, if you remember, I was supposed to tell you quantum computing's power five different ways. This is the fourth way. Well, the fifth way is how you would explain quantum computing to a graduate student. And of course, that's what we'll do for the next three months. <laughs> okay, I'll see you on Tuesday. Can you see this